have many, many difficult things. But Jesus came along and he, he had this man who was in a miserable condition. And this man was not only in dire need of physical healing, but he was also in bondage to some evil spirits. And I've always kind of wondered, as we hear the atrocities of our day, I don't remember ever once uh, anybody referring to evil spirits behind some of these events. And I always kind of wonder, when we hear of these atrocious atrocities that we continually hear in our country and across the world, remember, we really do have an enemy, and, and I kind of wonder if people still are being influenced by these evil spirits and these evil things that sometimes are affecting people to do what we think are just atrocious, atrocious things. We as believers understand that there are angelic beings and that there are demonic beings. There is no, as far as we know, UFOs, but if there is a UFO, they would be it, right? They would be it. And so we take a look at Matthew 12, 22 in our study for today, and here's the condition of this man. Then what was brought to him who was demon-possessed, blind and mute, and he healed him so that the blind and mute man both spoke and saw. What a marvelous thing. And I was talking to Al uh, about uh, his son earlier who's, uh, who's, had, who's been subject to so many different uh, difficulties and problems over the years. Uh, uh, and that one day for him, he'll be free. There's a, there's a hope. So sometimes healing comes in this life, but we do know that healing, if it doesn't come in this life, will come in the next life. So when, when God promised to heal, he's going to heal. And it may not be now, but it's certainly going to be later. But this particular man uh, had the benefit of the very presence of Jesus, and uh, Jesus actually uh, created a miracle for this man. So Jesus completely and instantaneously heals the man and rids him of his demon possession. And this was undeniable an act of God that even the demons gave test testimony to, we mentioned in Mark 3, 10 and 11. Now number three, people in wonder and amazement were saying, could this be the son of David? And that's what these miracles were supposed to do. They were supposed to jar people out of their complacency and say, wow, this is something only God can do. Who is this man who's doing these marvelous, miraculous things? So we take a look at Matthew 12, 23. And all the multitude were amazed and said, could this be the son of David? In other words, they're asking, is this the Messiah? That's what they're asking. And the crowd seemed on the verge of trying to make Jesus their king. And the Pharisees quickly responded, Matthew 12, 24. Now when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow does not cast out demons except by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. And this was the precise moment when everything changed. Everything changed. And this is number C, this is the unpardonable sin. Now we must read very attentively to what Jesus says here in Matthew 12, 31 and 32. 31 and 32. Therefore, I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven men. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. Now, I like what one commentator has written here. He was not saying that any and every blasphemy invoking the Holy Spirit's name is unpardonable. He was not announcing that there is some broad 
ambiguously defined category of unpardonable transgression, we need to live in fear, or lest we carelessly or accidentally speak words that place us forever beyond the reach of divine grace. In fact, Jesus specifically said, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, except the blasphemy against the Spirit, Matthew 12, 31. Number two, thus his solemn warning about this extraordinary act of unforgivable blasphemy was purposely prefaced by a comprehensive statement declaring every other imaginable kind of sin and blasphemy is forgivable. And that's important for us to grasp. Because sometimes there are people who just live in fear. Have I committed something that's unforgivable? And there's a, this is a good verse to go to. This is a really good verse to go to. So remember, every sin is damnable as long as the sinner remains impenitent and unbelieving. John 3.18. So let's take a look at John 3.18. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So there's some people that are already condemned. So it's not a matter of going before the Lord and finding if you're going to heaven or not. Some people are already condemned. There's no, their judgment has already taken place. So unbelief already brings what? Judgment. Yeah, it's a, it's a damnable offense. So unbelief brings judgment. But even the vilest sin is forgivable with repentant faith. And that's what's so wonderful. You know, that's why you and I sit here today and we just worship the Lord and marvel and adore him because I know I don't deserve anything. I know my sins are as black as any that we want to read in here. But he said they're forgiving if I would repent and come in faith to him. And that's our 1 John 1, 9. Um, many people know 1 John 1, 9, but if you're not sure, let's take a look at it. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Uh, how many cling to that verse? Yeah. Yay. Yes. yeah, I cling to that verse. But here's number four. One very specific sin is instantly and permanently damnable. A singular, flagrant, malicious, deliberate evil act of blasphemy against the spirit according to Matthew 12 31 and the definite article is kind of crucial here there is a clear and significant contrast between every other sin and blasphemy versus this one particular sin that will not be forgiven okay so how many do we have hundreds of sins and you have one over on this side right so all of them over here they're all for forgivable but you have this one that sits out here right just just one okay here's number five this is number five it was the blasphemy this highly band of religious hypocrites had just uttered and that's kind of important now remember, sometimes it's the religious people of the world uh, that are the scariest people in the world, right? Yeah. Uh, when you look at uh, those who are contributing to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, you have certainly the Romans, and you might say, well, they're barbarians. But no, they, they had all kinds of gods. So they're very, very religious people. Idolatry, granted, but then you had the Jews, we had the oracles of God and everything else that went with it. 
you have the Messiah who's standing right in front of them, who produces all kind of miracles, and both the Romans and the Jews are con contributing to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. But here we have this, this band of religious hypocrites, and they had just done something horrendous. So we take a look at Matthew 12, 23, 24, 31, 32, Okay, so 12, 23. And all the multitude were amazed and said, Come, could this be the Son of David? Now when the Pharisees heard it, it said, This fellow does not cast out demons except by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. But Jesus knew their thoughts. And he said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself will not stand. If Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if he cast out demons by the oath above, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they shall be your judges. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can you enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless the first bind the strong man? And then he will plunder his house. And he who has not with me is against me. And he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. Therefore I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men. But the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven men. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. Now, in trying to discredit Jesus with a blatant blasphemy, claiming that his miracle was being accomplished with Satan's power, they credited Satan with what Jesus had done through the power of the Holy Spirit. They had just watched Jesus vanquish demons. Number seven, they fully grasped who Jesus was and with what authority he spoke and acted according to a number of passages of scripture. And I just want to look at some of these. Take a look at Luke 6, 10 and 11. Luke 6, 10 and 11. Six ten in Luke says, and when he had looked around at them all, he said to the man, stretch out your hand, and he did so. And his hand was restored as whole as the others. Verse 11, but they were filled with rage and discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. Take a look at John eleven forty seven. John eleven forty seven. Forty-seven and forty-eight. Forty-seven is, Woe to you, for you blind the tombs of the prophets, and your fathers killed them. In fact, you bear witness that you approve the deeds of your father, for they indeed killed them, and you build uh, their tombs. Yeah, that's the wrong word. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, 47, 48. Mm -hmm. uh, woe to you, for you blind, you build the tombs of the prophets. John 11. John 11. Oh. <laughs> He's not perfect. <laughs> I didn't turn up pages. Okay, 47 and 48. Then, then the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, what shall we do for this man works many signs? If we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and nation. And then uh, we're taking a look at John 12, 9. Now a great many of the Jews knew that he was there, and they came, not for Jesus' sake only, but they that they might also see Lazarus, 
whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priest plotted to put Lazarus to death also. And then Acts 4.16. saying, what shall we do to these men? For indeed, that a notable miracle has been done through, these, through them is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. So, when we look at these particular verses, what are we looking at? They had grasped, they had grasped what was going on here. They had truly grasped what was going on. And yet, they hated him. So they grasped what's going on. He's healing, he's identifying himself, but yet they ended up hating him. Thus, when Jesus spoke to them, it was without mercy and it is without grace. And I want to tell you, there's, there's something that, that, there are some things that are, being, that are terrifying to me to think about. When you think about hell, as a place without mercy and without grace, it's something hard, hard for me to fathom. It's just hard for me to, great, uh, to grasp. Now, I can wake up this morning. I can see. I can smell. I can uh, enjoy. I can uh, look around. I can uh, worship. I can gather. I can, there's so many different things that, because of the grace of God, I can experience. Now, if you removed every pleasure Every enjoyment, every anything that you find would be a blessing in your life. Remove it all and compound that, you're probably going to end up with hell. But think of an individual who's now already there, but they haven't been sentenced there. So think of an individual who's now been pronounced by God, by Jesus, no mercy and no grace. And we think God is all merciful and always graceful, and it's just simply not true. Yes, he is. He has been to me. But the only reason, the only reason is he, he has allowed me to believe, and he has allowed me to repent. But there are those in this particular instance that they have no mercy and they have no grace. And that's what Matthew 34 and 37, Matthew 12, 34, and 37. Brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, verse 37. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Their sin was so hideous and hateful that Jesus damned them forever on the spot. On the spot. In essence, here is a preview of God's final judgment. Jesus, to whom all judgment has been committed, formally pronounced them guilty, right then and there. His verdict was rendered publicly, emphatically, and without, without uh, any mercy, grace, and it was a finality. They were now sealed forever in the darkness and hardness of their heart that they had chosen for themselves. And we see, we see this on a couple of occasions. For instance, uh, when you look at some Old Testament passages, for instance, like a Pharaoh. Now, Moses is continually doing his miracles before Pharaoh, right? And Pharaoh ends up doing what to his heart? Hardening. Hardening his heart. What does God do to his heart? Hardening. Solidifies it. So, so it's, it's hard, and so it's not going to change. And that's the way it is. And so, right here, this is exactly what happens to these individuals. Because of their hardness of heart, their evil that they had contributed, that they had attributed to 
the Spirit of God and chosen for themselves because they had witnessed these things, they had accepted them as real, uh, they didn't deny anything, that God now solidifies their heart and their condition for all eternity. That is the most frightening place to ever be, right? It's the most frightening place. So all Jesus' miracles were done according to the will of the Father through the power of the Holy Spirit. Take a look at Luke 4.14. Luke 4.14 says, Then Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and news of him went out through all the surrounding region. So, how did Jesus function in this world? Always by the power of the Spirit of God. How are you and I supposed to function in this world? Same way. Same way. Can, can we live the Christian life? No. Not in and of yourself. We need what? A power outside of ourselves. And Jesus, when he became son, when he, as the son of God, who makes us sons of God, the way he functioned is the way we function. Let me just give you a couple other verses here. <clears throat> Uh, John 5, 19. And when they could not find how they might bring him in because of the crowd, they went up to the housetop and let him down with his bed through the, through the tiles into the midst before Jesus. Wrong verse. Oh, wrong verse again. Sorry. Keep flipping over. I'm flipping over too many verses here. John 5. And 19 it says this. Then Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the Father do, for whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. Uh, verse 30. I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is righteous, because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. We're still in John 8, 28. Then Jesus said to them, When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my father taught me, I speak these things. And one more. This is in Acts 10.37. Acts 10.37. That, uh, that word you know, which was proclaimed throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism of... Uh, John... Which John preached, how God uh, anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were com- oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. So, here we have a number of verses that that are saying the same identical thing, right? And they're all saying that Jesus did not, in and of himself, separate from God do anything. He was relying on God. Yep. Was was that the first time like when the Holy Spirit hit him, that's when he performed everything? When he got baptized and he came out of the water? Or did he do things before that? No, their miracles were not done until the Spirit of God. Okay. Yep. Alright, All right. thank you. So yeah, when he starts his ministry, he's it's the he has the Spirit of uh, God on him. And that's what makes it so important for you and I to even see these kind of things. Because uh, we have the Holy Spirit indwelling us. 
And, and we have the Spirit of God that's been provided to us to fill us, in other words, so that he can control us. Now, he always uses the Word of God, so that's why, uh, that's why it's, the Word of God is so important to us, because he's the author of it, and he uses his Word to bring us under that control. So when a person is never in the Word of God, it's very difficult for me to actually, actually grasp well, how in the world is the Spirit of God going to guide, direct, and, and bring this person to the place he needs to be. It's not really going to happen because the Word of God is what he uses. So the Word of God becomes so crucial to the believer's life. So part of our coming under the control of the Spirit is always going to involve the Word of God. That's why we're always stressing what? Yeah, read it, know it, memorize it, meditate on it, make it a part of your real life, see through it, do it, do what it says. Everything that the Spirit of God does is going to come through the Word of God. And we cannot live the Christian life in and of ourselves. So not only do we need a power from above, we need uh, we need to know what he has to say. Uh, so the Spirit of God is what actually powered Jesus, energized Jesus, and he did not do anything in and of himself. Now, I don't know about you, that puts me in a very precarious place if I should wake up this, this day and say, okay, I'm going to live my way. I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to live without you know, consulting or relying on the Spirit of God. I'm in a bad place, right? I'm in a real bad place. And there's many, many times that we wake up and we live our lives and we just go through our day and we don't think about coming under the control of the Spirit of God. <clears throat> but that's our power. That's what we really need. But to attribute our Lord's miracles to Satan was to credit Satan with the Holy Spirit's work. The signs and wonders the Pharisees saw were real and incontrovertible. They uttered their blasphemy with full awareness that they were opposing God, lying about his anointed servant, and blaspheming his Holy Spirit. That was so serious that they were condemned on the spot. So that was it for them. There was now no hope for them. And this is really uh, unusual to see a, a, a group of people that actually are in a place of no hope. Because we always say there's always hope for as long as you breathe, right? There's always hope. There wasn't hope for these people. There was no hope. And sometimes it's the religious people that find themselves in that place. Because they actually will attribute things that only God can do and actually blame it or attribute it to Satan. So they had deliberately closed their eyes and stopped their ears to the truth for so long they're rejecting the most powerful possible testimony to the truth and they chose to lie instead. And this is the reality of Hebrews 6, uh, 4 through 6. So let me take a look at Hebrews 6, 4 through 6. Hebrews 6, 4 through 6 says this, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the power of the age to come, if they fall away to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. And, and this is reality of Hebrews 6, 4 through 6. You, we have it with these individuals in Matthew 12. It was impossible. 
It was just impossible. So had they seen what the Holy Spirit had done? Yes. Had they recognized it as a power of God? Yes. And yet they would lie about it to protect themselves from what they thought they were going to lose. After this, Jesus would conceal the truth from them by the use of parables in his public teaching. So publicly, when Jesus now would preach among the masses, how did he speak? Parables. And parables were meant to conceal the truth to these individuals, because he wasn't going to minister to them anymore. Their fate was sealed in concrete. Everything he taught in public from that day forward would be concealed from everyone except those who had willing ears to hear. So it was going to be concealed except to those who had willing ears to hear. And we have sometimes, I think, the same type of problem today. Very religious people, very good people, very good people. But they won't hear what God's word has to say. Just won't hear it. They won't listen to it. And I'm not saying that they commit the unpardonable sin because they're not contributing. They're not actually saying the Holy Spirit uh, is, uh, you know, this is something that uh, Satan has done. Uh, and, and it's the Holy Spirit who's really done the work. What I'm saying is, the Word of God becomes not understandable to many, many people. Many, many, many people. And the reason it's not understandable to many, many people is because they're not willing to hear it. Well, somebody who's willing to hear it, God does what? Man, He, he, opened, he will pour it into you. He'll help you learn. He'll help you grow. You'll learn the, the dependence upon the Spirit of God. You'll learn these very things. And so this was a major, major turning point in how Jesus responds to people, especially the Pharisees. And I'm not saying that we have uh, the, uh, the same exact setting, uh, because Jesus is not here presently with us, performing miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle, uh, we don't have that necessarily today. So people who are going to be committing the unpardonable sin fall into more the category of unbelief. And unbelief puts you in the same kind of situation that these Pharisees are in. So unbelief is going to leave you to the place where I don't understand what the Bible says, but if it's explained to you and the Spirit of God has convicted you and you still reject it, what's left? If God does everything that's needed to be done, he's provided you a Savior, he provides you the Spirit of God, he provides you the Word of God, he provides everything you need, and you say, I don't believe it. What's left? You will believe a lie over the truth. And that's what happens to many, many religious people. They will believe a lie over what the Word of God actually reveals as being true. And when you get to that place, there's nothing else God is going to do. You think he's going to keep... keep um, Keep revealing truth and revealing truth and revealing truth, or as you reveal truth, do you slide further down into unbelief? That's often what happens. So it becomes, you don't even hear, you're not interested. And, and that's, that's the condition of many people's hearts today. And unfortunately, it's often many religious people that fall into that category. So you can be Catholic, you can be Protestant, you can be Islam, you can be all kinds of different things today, right? It doesn't really matter what you are. 
what you want to call yourself. Remember, there are no distinctions with God. There just are no distinctions. We make distinctions. But with God, there's no distinctions. There are no Catholics, there are no Protestants, and there's no Islams, there's no Hindus, right? There's none of those. There's either believers or what? Unbelievers, and that's the only two categories we got. Believers or unbelievers. And you'll find believers and unbelievers are all kind of names that we give ourselves. All kind of names we give ourselves. Some of them, because of their teachings, are so lost, they're, the only hope that they possibly have is if a God miraculously works in their hearts. And once he does that, and he convicts, and he brings to light the truth, one of my prayers was, in these earthquake victims that are buried under the rubble, was, Lord, would you give them a vision of yourself before it's too late? And I've heard of the Lord doing that. You know, I've heard of him giving people visions in that part of the world. Um, and they're, you know, for some Muslims, they've turned to Christ. Because he has done a work in their hearts, and he's opened up, and they've received him. But if he does that, and they reject him, then what? They're condemned. They're going to be just like this. Now, I don't think we have the unpardonable sin repeated, 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 but we do have unbelief, 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 and they actually end up with the same result, don't they? Mm -hmm. We end up with the same result. So do we, say, do we say, well, you have the unpardonable sin repeated today? I would say not. You don't have the presence of Jesus Christ, but you have the results of unbelief that are being repeated today. And people are being solidified, just like a pharaoh. <clears throat> their hearts are hard. And when their hearts are hardened by themselves, and God comes along and solidifies that because you end up believing a lie, where do you go from there? That's why it's a very serious condition when you get to the place of unbelief. Very, very serious. Because what is it that you're going to hear different about Jesus Christ? about his death, about his resurrection, about who he is, God in the flesh. What are you going to say to that person? I'm going to open up the word and say, well, this is what it says. You're going to say, I don't believe it. What else am I going to offer you? What else am I going to tell you? What other bits of persuasion can I possibly offer you? I can warn them. Right. I can warn them about the eternal place that they're heading to, but many people don't believe in hell either. True. One of these parables we get to, you're going to find that hell's going to be filled with religious people. Isn't that scary? That is scary. Hell's going to be filled. I mean, the Pharisees, what were they? You won't get a more religious people in the world than the Pharisees. And yet these people rejected the Messiah. And these people were in unbelief. These people were permanently rejected. Permanently rejected. And their fate was cast in stone. What a terrible, terrible condition this is, right? But this is what unbelief does. Unbelief is just like this. I've always considered two great powers above all great powers. We think of atom bombs and hydrogen bombs and conflicts and all these type of things or the, the, the sun exploding, whatever. I think the greatest power there truly is is faith for human beings. And the second greatest one is unbelief. unbelief. To me, the greatest power is faith. Because it truly has a, a way of changing a life. Guess what unbelief does? It does the same thing. It, it does the same thing. It changes a life, and it solidifies your future. You know, there's a faith that solidifies your future here. There's unbelief that does the same thing, and it's eternal. That's the problem. It's eternal. There's no changing this place for this. 
This is eternal. And so the unpardonable sin is really a frightening, frightening, frightening thing. But it shows you the power of unbelief. That's all that we have for you today.